What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. Today, I'll be ranking every single 2024 NASCAR Cup Series points paying race. I'm going to go from the worst, which is 36, up to the best, which is number one. So, anyways, let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. In the number 36 position, we have the Bassler Shops Night Race from Bristol Motor Speedway. This was probably one of the worst races I have ever seen at Bristol Motor Speedway from start to finish. Kyle Larson led almost the whole entire race. He took the lead on lap number 32 or lap 33 and pretty much led every single lap except one on one of the late race restarts. But Kyle Larson just flat out dominated and the racing behind Kyle Larson was just not good. Nobody could pass. You couldn't make any lanes. You couldn't run the bottom and get by somebody. It was just so difficult, and no one could make moves to the inside or really to the outside as well. And everyone just could not pass a major issue that this next car, of course, really has. Especially with how good the spring race was. It was such a major letdown, and for me, the worst race of 2024. In the number 35 position, we have the Cookout 400 from Martinsville Speedway. Now, the storyline coming in this race was really, really cool, where we saw all the Hendrick cars completely dominate and them get the victory with William Byron. However, the racing just was not that good. You could not pass in this spring race. So difficult to pass. And the fact that Joey Logano could hold on on literally 200 lap tires over guys at 20 or even 50 lap fresher tires is a major, major problem. He only started falling off after 200 laps on these tires. And the racing itself wasn't great. Sure, we had an interesting finish at the end with the overtime restart where William Byron held up a hard charge and Kyle Larson, William Byron, and uh, Chase Elliott and uh, Bubble Walls as well. But the racing just was not that good. You had a really cool storyline in the 40-year anniversary. But outside of that, the racing was not very good in this race. In the number 34 position, we have the Toyota Owners 400 from Richmond Raceway. This is one of the most disappointing races of 2024. It actually started off really good. He had some rain tires coming into play, the damp tires, and I thought the first 30 to 40 laps were actually really solid. But once they put it back on the regular tires that they had, the racing just was not that good. But he had some very compelling strategy going on until NASCAR threw caution for Kyle Busch, who just went up in the groove and barely tapped the outside wall. And then they had that caution come out two laps ago after Kyle Larson and Bubba Wallace got into each other. And then you had the controversy where Denny Hamlin jumped the restart clear as day and didn't get a penalty for it because NASCAR really screwed the pooch there. To me, it just was not a good race overall, and the racing kind of sucked at Richmond like it has at other Richmond races in the past. In the number 33 position, we have the Shriners Children 500 from Phoenix Raceway. This race just cuss kind of wasn't a thing, in my opinion, that really had a lot of compelling stuff. Granny saw Toyota completely dominate, and he did have some interesting stuff that did happen throughout the event, but really there wasn't much memorable from this race, personally. There just wasn't much that really happened. Toyota completely dominated, very difficult to pass. Dirty Air was a major problem in this race, and it just was one of the most boring races I think we've seen of 2024. I just feel like a lot more needed to happen in this race. And granted, there was definitely some yells that came out. It had a big one that happened where a couple cars in the back of the pack wrecked. But outside of that, this race is a little bit boring to me and not the most exciting race. But that's Phoenix for you. It's not the most exciting racetrack on the schedule. In the number 32 position, we have the 2024 Brickyard 400. Look, it was really cool to see the Brickyard 400 coming back, but my expectations were really, really low. Now, positive is, is the fact that it did at least come back, and I think it was better than the last time we ran the Brickyard 400 in 2020. But the racing itself just was not that great. You really had one guy dominate. Now, you had a really competing field mileage finish that was really, really coming into play, and I thought that was really cool. But outside of that, it got controversial. You had multiple restart controversies with Kyle Larson maybe jumping a restart, even though I don't really think he did. You also, of course, did have the situation where they didn't throw the caution until Kyle Larson crossed the line when Ryan Priest clearly was not going to go. It was cool to see Kyle Larson get redemption after going over and running the Indy 500 and not winning the race and getting that iconic scheme to victory lane. But outside of that, this race was not just not that great and not that exciting overall. In the number 31 position, we have the NASCAR Cup Series Championship race from Phoenix. Now, this race 
was definitely a little bit better than the spring race. There's definitely a little bit of better racing than we've seen in the past at this track, but it was not that great personally. And you had a really bad storyline coming into it, and you also had a driver who probably shouldn't have won the championship go to the win the championship. Now, I will say the end of the race, the final 25 to 30 laps of this race, Really made this race and going probably one of the worst two or three races of the year up at least a little bit higher. Because I do think the final run between Blaney, between Blaney and Logano battling for the win, I thought was really intriguing. But also at the same time, you had a lot of dirty air that really came into play. For me, it just wasn't that great of a race. It could have been a lot better, but that's Phoenix for you. But it wasn't awful, but it was not that great of a race in my honest opinion. In the number 30 position, we had the Auto Trader Echo Park 500 from Texas Motor Speedway, the Auto Trader Echo Park 400. This race to me is probably one of the more overrated races, and the fact it's number 30 shows that this race really was not that good. Was it better than other Texas races we've seen in the past? Yes, no question. I think 2022 was not that great of an all-star race, and I think the race that happened later that year wasn't that good. The only cool thing we saw was Chase Elliott get his first win in over a year and go to Victory Lane in Texas. But if you have to have a lot of wrecks to make a race really exciting and really, really fun, that doesn't make a good race in my opinion. Was it completely horrible? No, but it wasn't that great. There were so many cautions. And before that, we all forget that Kyle Larson was just flat out dominating this race. And outside of that, there just wasn't a memorable driver going and winning except Chase Elliott. I just don't think this race is that exciting. It could have been a lot better, and it wasn't a great race in my opinion. In the number 29 position, we have the 2024 Ally 500 400 from Nashville Super Speedway. This is probably one of the more disappointing races of 2024 because the last couple of years at National Super Speedway, I think the racing has been pretty good and it's been getting only better and better and better. This time around, the racing just wasn't that great, at least in the first half of the event. But as the race progressed and he had fuel mileage coming into play at the end, I think it was setting up to be really, really good. Until it wasn't great when Austin Cindric ended up spinning out and causing us to go to not one, not two, not three, not four, but five overtimes. And drivers lost their standards and lost their heads. That's one of the reasons this race is so low on my list this year. Because despite the fact I don't think the race, racing product-wise, was worse than some of the races coming up. I think the end of the race, unfortunately, dropped this so low on the list. Because I think the driving standards were completely lost throughout the event. And I think for me, that's why it's so low. Because the driving standards were completely gone. In the number 28 position, we have the Enjoy Illinois 300 from Worldwide Technology Raceway Gateway. This, to me, was a race that was kind of a little bit of a slow burner. I actually went to this race and sat in turn number one. First two stages, I'm going to admit, were not that great. Christopher Bell just flat out dominated, but he did have a couple decent battles for the lead and throughout the pack, but it was still very difficult to pass. What made this race go higher was the final stage. You have multiple strategies, and you have multiple drivers that emerge, and I feel like the last 40 to 50 laps especially was really, really solid in my opinion. You didn't know if Chris Revelle was going to hang on, but then, of course, Chris Revelle had an engine failure or was losing the engine, and Ryan Blaney got the lead. And then on the white flag, we all think Ryan Blaney's got it, and he runs out of gas, and Austin Center takes the lead and picks up a second career Cup Series win. I think the finish was really, really good. The race itself, not so great, but I think at least for Gateway, it continues to bring a lot of memorable moments. I think for me, that's why it's a little bit higher on the list than other years. In the number 27 position, we have the Bank of America Roll 400 from the Charlotte Roll. I think this was for sure the best Charlotte Roll race that we have seen in the next gen era. But the racing just was not that great overall. I do think that turn that they added actually made the racing interesting, but you had a lot of drivers that lost their driving standards throughout the event. And I think that's also something that did affect the race. And Kyle Larson just flat out dominated. And then, of course, it all got overshadowed by the fact that Alex Bowman got disqualified after the race. To me, while the race was definitely not that bad, it wasn't that great either. But I do think that the Roval should personally go away in the future. And I do think they should have reacted to Charlotte Oval as early as 2026. I really hope they can do that because I think the Charlotte Oval could or should come back. Because I think the racing will be better at the Charlotte Oval than the Charlotte Roval. In the number 26 position, we have the Great American Getaway 400 from Pocono Raceway. This is probably one of the more forgettable races of 2024. 
There was some retaliation and stuff that happened in the race. You had Corey LaJoy just flat out dump Kyle Busch. And he had a couple of interesting wrecks that happened. And he had a compelling ending to the race where Ryan Blaney passed Alex Bowman in the late stages. But for most of the event, it was just kind of one of those races that was just there. For me, I think the last couple of Pocono races have been better than this one. I think there's been better Pocono races, and I think the especially the Xfinity Series race, I think Xfinity ran there, I'm not, don't remember, but I do think the Xfinity race they ran there was definitely better than this one. I think it was just one of those races that was just kind of there for me. It was cool to see Ryan Blaney go to Victory Lane, but for me, it was kind of boring and not the most exciting race in the world. It wasn't great, but not terrible, and that's why it's a little bit lower on the list for me this year. In the number 25 position, we have the USA Today 301 from New Hampshire Motor Speedway. This race wasn't that great at the beginning, to be honest. I do think it did have some interesting battles developing. He did have a good battle between Chris Bell, I believe, and Chase Elliott early. And he did have some drivers that emerged early in the race. The race got very interesting when the rain tires came in. I think that did improve the race a little bit, but it also you did have a lot of how NASCAR just really did a terrible job managing this race when it came to the rain. They didn't do a great job managing it, and I think they had a lot of fumbles throughout this event as well. It was cool to see SHR have a chance to maybe get their final win at the time for, of course, they did win the Southern 500 later in the year, but I don't think the race was absolutely great. I think it definitely could have been a lot better, and I think for me, it was just a little bit there, and it had a little bit of controversy, which NASCAR seems to always find a way to be involved in controversy. In the number 24 position, we have the Grand Park 165 from the Chicago Street Course. This race is definitely a little bit of a mess from start to finish. Rain came out of nowhere literally one or two hours prior to the race, and how NASCAR managed this race wasn't great. I think the racing itself was honestly solid throughout. You had a lot of intriguing battles, especially early in stage number one. But after a really great NASCAR Xfinity Series race the prior day, we saw Shane Van Gisbergen and, and Kyle Larson battling for the win. There was just too much chaos for me in this race. There was way too much going on that dropped this race so low. Compared to last year, where I think in 2023, the rain actually made the race a lot better. But I think that the rain this time hurt the product and how NASCAR, like I said, managed where the start time was and also how they managed the clock a little bit. I think that really affected the race for me. And I think it was cool to see Alex Bowman win. You had an interesting finish at the end. But overall, it could have definitely been a much better race. In the number 23 position, we have the Echo Park Automotive Grand Prix from Circuit of the Americas. This race to me is kind of a forgettable race a little bit compared to the last year's where I think the racing in 2022 and 2023 was definitely a lot better than this race. I do think this race did have some moments and some shining points though. I do think there were some good battles up front, especially early in the event. And did have a solid and compelling finish at the end. You're wondering if Chris Bell was going to catch William Byron before the end of the event because Chris Bell had a few lap extra fresher tires than William Byron. And I think that was making it for a very interesting finish. But outside of that, you kind of knew once everything kind of fell through that it just wasn't going to be that close of a finish, right? Because William Byron still had over a second and a half lead, I believe, over Chris Bell at the end of the day. There was no way that he was going to catch him. It was a decent finish, but the racing could have definitely been a lot better. It was just kind of one of those races that was just there for me. In the number 22nd position, we have the 2024 Coca-Cola 600. Probably the biggest downgrade from the last few years on the rankings. This race just kind of had a black cloud hanging over it. We had the huge rainstorm that came across the United States from the central U.S. all the way to the East Coast in the southeast of the country that affected the Indy 500 and the Coke 600. And this race just never really had that flow. Now, it was improving throughout the event, and it was getting a little bit better. But as soon as the race is starting to get very intriguing... They had the lightning stuff come in, you had the rain come in, and then NASCAR and Fox theoretically really played a role in this race getting called early, and we never got to see Kyle Larson have the chance and opportunity to run the Coke 600 because NASCAR and Fox really made the decision to call it early. I think how this race ended was one of the first really bad decisions of the year, and it really affected the outcome of this race for me and really this season as a whole because it did affect Larson, of course, having a chance to win the regular season championship a little bit, had Larson had a shot, I think he would have been able to do it and we wouldn't have had this waiver conversation we had I think it just was a little bit of a frustrating race overall in the number 21 position we have the 2024 Toyota Save Mart 350 from Sonoma Raceway I think this objectively was probably one of the better Sonoma races that we have seen in recent years was it great no 
But you had some very compelling battles, especially the final 15 to 20 laps where you had Kyle Larson on fresh tires because tires actually meant something in this race. Kyle Larson was running down guys like Kyle Busch and Mara Tricks Jr. and, of course, Chris Buescher at the end of the event. And you didn't know if Kyle Larson was going to catch him, but the tires really were great, and Larson also just had a much better car and got through the traffic the best. You also had some big wrecks that took out guys like Cam Waters in the event. I believe Will Brown also got involved in that wreck as well. You just saw a very compelling race throughout the whole entire event. I do think that it was a little sloppy at points as well, but for me, I think it was a very solid race at Sonoma, and it did put on a really solid show overall. In the number 20 position, we have the gold bowling at the Glen from Watkins Glen. This race for me was definitely a major upgrade over last year's race. This race was definitely way, way better. You had a lot of really awesome storylines going on. The race is dominated by Shane Van Gisberg and Ross Chastain, but you also had underdogs like Carson Ospar and Chris Buescher showing up up front and competing for the win. And then it led to a really awesome finish between Chris Buescher and SVG, who just put on a really solid and really great show where Busher was able to get the lead at the end of the day and pick up his first win and only win of 2024. I think it was a good race for Watkins Glen Sanders. It kind of felt like a normal road course race to me. And overall, it was just a very solid and good product on the track at times. It was sloppy near the end, but I do think the product was really, really solid. And like I said, we saw a pretty solid and a pretty good finish at this track. It was pretty good for Watkins Glen Sanders. In the number 19 position, we have the Cookout 400 from Richmond Raceway. Unlike the spring, the summer race was way, way better. You had the intrigue of basically the softer tire they used at North Wilkesboro. And it worked out actually really, really well. We saw some interesting strategy throughout the event. And we saw also some very, very good battles throughout the whole entire race as well. You had a really interesting charge from Austin Dillon at the end of the race where he could have won before that caution came out. And then, of course, why this race is a little bit lower is because how the race ended. And it was a super, super controversial ending to a NASCAR Cup Series event that led to this major debate about Austin Dillon should be in the playoffs or not. But if you take away all the controversy near the end of the race and the bad etiquette from Austin Dillon, I got to say the racing was pretty solid. And I do think this race did have some good moments for sure. One of the better Richmond races I probably have seen in recent years and definitely in recent memory as well. In the number 18 position, we have the Xfinity 500 from Martinsville Speedway. This objectively was probably the best short track race we've seen at Martinsville in the next-gen era. And this race, of course, had a much softer tire, which led to good racing. Was it perfect? No. But I think it definitely was a major step in the right direction. The first 499 laps I thought were really, really good. And especially in the last 80-ish laps, we had a really compelling battle between Kyle Larson, Ryan Blaney, and Chase Elliott. And you weren't sure which one was going to win. And the fact that Ryan Blaney was able to use the fresh tires and get back up to the front was absolutely incredible. It showed how dominant that car was. And it always was good racing throughout the field as well. Aside from the controversy at the end with the race manipulation, I think this race was very, very good at points and one of the best Mars races we've seen and one of the best short track races I think we've seen in recent memory and in quite a bit of time as well. I think it was a solid race overall. In the number 17 position, we have the War 400 from Dover Speedway. I think this is one of the best Dover races we've seen in the next gen era. I think in the next gen era, Dover has been one of the more underrated tracks we have seen this year and in recent years as well. And I think the racing was generally really, really good. And while you did have dirty air that came into the play at that finish between Kyle Larson and Denny Hamlin, the fact that Kyle Larson could stay as close to Denny Hamlin as he could showed that I think Kyle Larson did have a faster car than Denny Hamlin. But what's crazy is, of course, was Denny Hamlin's last win of 2024, which I don't think anybody really expected at the time. But I think the racing was pretty good throughout the field. You had some interesting storylines like Kyle Busch being up front throughout the event and running up front consistently and other drivers that you didn't think were going to be factors being factors throughout the race. I think it was a solid race overall and a pretty decent ending to the race as well. In the number 16 position, we have the Iowa Corn 350 from Iowa Speedway. This race had a little bit of unfortunate concern considering how IndyCar kind of ran basically during the testing, and we also had a lot of tire issues during practice. But once it came down tonight, and once they started racing in the middle to late afternoon, 
I got to say the racing was really, really entertaining. I think Iowa really lived up. Now, of course, this did not have the short track package. It had the intermediate package for this race. But I think for Iowa, it was a very good opening event. And it had a very popular guy who's kind of local to this track going to victory lane in this race. I think it was just generally a really, really solid product, right? I know the ending wasn't as good as it could have been. But I think the first like 70 or 80% of the race was absolutely great. And you weren't sure if someone like a Josh Berry could come up there. And Kyle Larson, of course, was great. But he had good racing throughout the field. I think Iowa has been a solid track. And I think it's good that they'll be going back next year. So I do think it was a pretty good race as a whole. In the number 15 position, we have the Quaker State 400 from Atlanta Motor Speedway. I got to say this race was definitely very, very solid, but not as good as the spring race. I think this race didn't have as much of the great racing we saw in the spring at Atlanta Motor Speedway. I still think it's pretty good. I think Atlanta in the next-gen era has generally been really, really good, and the racing product has been very, very solid. The finish was definitely a little bit frustrating at the end with some of the late cautions. We also had that big wreck for Kyle Larson that took place. But I do think the racing at Atlanta was pretty entertaining, especially for an opening race. I think it provided some very interesting moments. And, of course, was one of Joey Logano's four wins that he got this year. I think it was a solid race as a whole. I think it had some good moments. He had some underdogs running well, like Austin Sinek running great, and Deion Suarez having one of his better races of the year, and Alex Bowman really showing he's capable, considering the rumors about him potentially losing his ride at earlier this year. But I think it was a very soft and pretty good race as a whole. A good race for NASCAR. In the number 14 position, we have the 2024 Cookout Southern 500 from Darlington Raceway. This race was definitely a slow burner, but it improved as the race progressed and went on. This race was no doubt a domination fest by Kyle Larson for the first 70 to 75% of the event. It felt very similar to 2018 where Larson dominated. But as the race continued to progress, you had drivers emerging. You had Chase Briscoe, who had a really good chance and opportunity to win Stu Ross Racing's final race, which he ended up doing. That move he made at the end of the race, passing Kyle Larson and Kyle Busch and those guys, to me, was super, super impressive. And one of the best moves I think we've seen in 2024. I think it was a very, very good ending, a really storybook ending for Super Haas Racing. I think the racing was just so, so good to watch. Darlington always delivers. Yes, dirty air was a factor in the finish, but I think the race itself was not that bad. And I think it was a pretty exciting and pretty fun race for Darlington. I've never really seen a race at Darlington has been bad. I think this race was definitely pretty good. In the number 13 position, we have the Geico 500 from Talladega Super Speedway. This, to me, is probably one of the more actual underrated races of 2024. Were they feel-saving a lot in this race? Sure. And I think that's one thing that they definitely need to work on when it comes to the next-gen car. But I think that you had some good moments for sure. You had a third lane emerging at times and a fourth lane that was emerging at times throughout the event as well. And I think you had some good stuff going on. I think one reason why this race was where people were frustrated was the fact that Fox had so many full screen commercials in this race. Probably one of the worst broadcasts I think we saw on the cup side this year for Fox. It was just very, very lax of days ago. Too many commercials throughout the event. And that's why this race was not as high for a lot of people. I think more people are frustrated about that. And the fact there were so many full screen commercials. I think it had good moments for sure. You saw Tyler Reddick get his first of two or three wins of the year. I think it was a very solid and pretty fun event. Despite the fact that field miles does come into play. I think it was a very solid race. In the number 12 position, we have the Penzo F400 from Las Vegas Motor Speedway. With how many good races we had at the end of this year, some probably forgot how good and very intriguing the finish was of this race at Las Vegas. Early in the event, Kyle Larson set the tone as the fastest car. But you had drivers like Kyle Busch and Tyler Reddick and Ryan Blaney who were also just as fast as Kyle Larson throughout the event at times. And especially on the long run, Tyler Reddick was the fastest car in this race on the super long run. But it was really the first time that we've seen Kyle Larson put up a dominating clinic in 2024, which would not be the last time. And Las Vegas just saw really good racing. You had multiple grooves available. You had guys making moves to the inside of the outside. And that's one thing about this track that is usually really, really entertaining and really, really good. I think Vegas is all a track. And they're talking about making the season finale, which it could be a good track for a season finale in the future. In the number 11 position, we have the Goodyear 400 from Darlington Raceway. Very similar to the Southern 500, this was a slow burner race. Because really early in this event, I got to say, 
it wasn't the most exciting. Sure, you had a lot of different drivers that were emerging, but usually Darlington is a track like it usually is that takes some time to really get going and putting on a great product. But once the event really starts getting going, it's a great race. The final 50, 60 laps in particular were absolutely incredible. You had three drivers battling for the win, Tyler Reddick, Chris Buescher, and Brad Keselowski. Originally, it looked like that Kozlowski was going to lose and Busher was going to win. But then Tyler Reddick pulled the slide job move with less than 10 laps to go. And that led to Brad Kozlowski picking up his first win in three years. It was such a great win, such a good battle at the end. We saw nearly a fight break out on pit road after it concluded. And Tyler Reddick felt bad. And then, yeah, Busher's iconic. I don't have that sticker on my door. But I think for me, the Goodyear Foreigner was definitely a slow burner that really built itself in. But I think the racing was generally really, really good at Darlington like he usually is and I think it was definitely a very fun race as a whole in the number 10 position we have the fire keepers casino 400 from Michigan Speedway in the last couple years Michigan has really grown on me as a racetrack and I think in the next gen era this is no exception this track is really starting to come into its own and it's really starting to age super super beautifully now I think the race on Sunday and Monday was great you had some very iconic moves in this race. You also had a flip from Corey LaJoy. But you had Bubba Wall sending it from freaking out of nowhere, getting such a huge run in passing Kyle Larson, I believe Denny Hamlin, and getting the race lead. And it just continued on from there. And you had a lot of drivers like Kyle Busch up there, Tyler Reddick, William Byron, and Larson who had crashed out earlier in the event, who basically said early week was better than Max Verstappen. But then you had some really good racing too. Michigan in the next gen era has been an absolute amazing track forward standards and it's gotten so much better in recent years and i think michigan is a good track nowadays on the cup side and i think the next gen car has raced so well it's kind of similar to auto club in a way in the number nine position we have the hollywood casino 400 from kansas speedway while this race was not as good as the spring race at kansas which we're going to talk about here later this race was still very very solid the racing product was very entertaining at times. You had good racing throughout the field, and you had a lot of different drivers that definitely emerged. Though Cristobal dominated a lot of this race, he never won a stage. And then he had a really compelling finish, and he had a good battle between Kyle Busch and Ross Chastain. Then Kyle Busch spins out, and in the final 10 to 15 laps, are really compelling to see if Ross Chastain can get the win or if William Byron can get his first win since Circuit of the Americas. For me, it was just a very intriguing ending to the race, and it was really cool to see Ross Chastain pick up the win in victory. It was a good race overall, very, very solid product, especially on the track, and to me, I think it was a great race as a whole, and once again, Kansas does not disappoint. It was a really, really solid and good race at Kansas Speedway. In the number eight position, we have the 2024 Daytona 500. This is a race to me that was very, very entertaining. One of the better Daytona 500s I think we've seen in recent memory. It was one of those slow burner races. And yes, fuel mileage saving was definitely a thing and it became a big controversy in this race. But you cannot deny that the drivers were putting on a really good show. And it didn't take until the end of the race for the last big wreck to really take event with around six or seven laps to go. They were putting on a show, putting on a great product, and I think the Daytona 500 really delivered on Monday. And you had that big feel, kind of like an old school Daytona 500 a little bit in a sense, except basically the fact that you basically had double wide instead of the single wide we had back in like the 80s and the 90s. To me, I think it was just generally a very, very fun product, and the stage finishes were really, really good as well. I think it's one of the more underrated races, and I think it was a pretty solid and fun race this year. I think it was a pretty fun race for 2024 standards. In the number seven position, we have the South Point 400 from Las Vegas Motor Speedway. This race was very, very intriguing. You had a lot of different contenders that showed up, even though Christabel put up an absolute dominant clinic throughout the race. But I do believe that the South Point 400 had an amazing finish. It was one of those incredible field mileage finishes that we have seen in the past as well. And I think it was leading to great stuff that was taking place. You had a lot of different strategy going on, and he had all the front row drivers and front row guys that were coming up to the front. And it looked like Christopher Bell, who had dominated, was going to go to victory lane until he wasn't. You didn't really know at the time he was going to win, and then, of course, led to Joey Logano going to victory. But I got to say, for Las Vegas Sanders, it was really, really fun, and that was a truly fun and classic race at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. I enjoyed it, and I think it was a great product and a really fun event at Las Vegas. One of my favorite races, definitely, of 2024. In the number six position, we have the Yellowwood 500 
from Talladega Super Speedway. This is probably going to be a little bit controversial, but I think this actually was a really fun and entertaining race. Yes, they were fuel saving a little bit, but you cannot tell me that it's easy to be four wide for nearly 15 to 20 laps straight. We have not seen that consistently in the next gen era where you had four wide, multiple rows back. And yes, it's probably one of those eye candy things that we see, but I think having four wide on the racetrack is really, really fun. And you have to have talent. I don't care if they're fuel saving or not. That's something there. And we didn't get the big one until nearly the end of the event. Now, the ending was definitely a little bit frustrating how NASCAR was doing the officiating and the calls and all that stuff, but that did not really affect my enjoyment of this race. I think it was a fun race as a whole, super, super enjoyable, and I think it was cool to see Lid Diffie Collins give Ricky Stenhouse Jr. the win, which was the final win for any of the Kroger brands at the team. I think it was a fun and really, really solemn and really, really great event overall. In the number five position, we have the Coke Zero Sugar 400 from Daytona. This, to me, was the best super speedway race, at least kind of super speedway race of 2024. I think this race was really, really entertaining. Drivers were going flat out, and you really did not know who was going to win until the end of the event. There were some wrecks that took place, but the big one really did not strike to near the end of the event. We had multiple flips that ended up taking place as well. But I think it just had that old school feel that we've seen in some other races as well. And to me, I love Daytona when it's bumpy, handling was coming into play, and he had a really fun, exciting finish where Harrison Burton beat Kyle Busch at the end, and we saw a really iconic call from Lee Diffie. I think the racing was really, really good, a very fun race as a whole, and I think it was absolutely one of the better races of 2024. Great racing as a whole, and fantastic racing at Daytona, like it always usually does perform. In the number four position, we have the Food City 500 from Bristol Motor Speedway. This was basically the best race on the old school side of things. This race was like a race in the 70s or 80s where you had to manage your tires. And basically, you had so many drivers that contended. It made Bristol super fun because Goodyear had found a way to bring a rubber compound or certain type of compound to the track with the weather. And it made the race so weird but so fun at the same time for me. Uh, there were a lot of fans that were frustrated, but the drivers figured it out over time. And we didn't have a lot of cautions near the end of the race. Yes, we had tires failing within 45 to 50 laps, but they were continuing to improve it and get better and better and better. And the engineers were really figuring it out. And he had a really good ending to the race where he didn't know if Denny Hamlin, Mark Truex Jr., Brad Kozlowski was going to win, which led to Denny Hamlin winning, even though his engine would be confiscated later, many, many months down the road. For me, this was a fantastic race, one of the best Bristol races I've ever seen. It was just one of those races that you really, really love and really enjoy. And to me, probably the best Bristol race I've seen and a very excellent and really fun race as a whole. In the number three position, we have the Ambetter Health 400 from Atlanta Motor Speedway. This is definitely the best race of the new school field. This race from start to finish was an absolute banger. This race had everything you wanted. It had the wrecks. It had the chaos. It had the amazing racing. It had the photo finish at the end. The closest three-wide finish we have seen in NASCAR history between Daniel Suarez, Ryan Blaney, and Kyle Busch. One of those guys that could have made the playoffs had they gone to victory lane, that being Kyle Busch. But you didn't know, really know who was going to win this race. And it just made for that race so, so fun to watch. And even drivers like Kyle Larson even said that that was some of the most fun they've ever had on a super speedway. And they said they would love to do it over and over and over again. I think that Atlanta always puts on a very, very good show. I think in the next gen era, it's been the best super speedway style race. And I think it's worked out really well in NASCAR's favor. It's been a good track for NASCAR up to this point. It was a very amazing race, and I think you had a really awesome and fun product as a whole at Atlanta Motor Speedway in the spring. It was a very awesome race. In the runner-up in second position, we have the Avon Health 400 from Kansas Speedway. Up until the final couple races of the year, this was definitely my number one pick. This is one of the best races I have ever seen from start to finish. At the beginning of this race, in stage number one in particular, you had a near 20 to 25 lap battle between guys like Christopher Bell, Kyle Larson, and Ross Chastain. And then you had Denny Hamlin that emerged. 
But then you had some field mileage stuff starting to come into play. But remember, there was a five-wide move that took place where guys like Chris Buescher and Kyle Larson were making five-wide moves, and they were battling really hard for the win and for the lead especially. And then you had the field mileage coming into play. So you had that side of things as well. And then when the cost came out for Kyle Busch, everyone's groaning like, oh God, we're going to have a lot of overtimes. But then we see one of the most iconic finishes in NASCAR history. We see the closest finish ever between Chris Buescher and Kyle Larson on the NASCAR Cup Series side by one one thousandth of a second. On the same weekend, the Kentucky Derby also had a photo finish. This race was so excellent from start to finish. Kansas, I would love to see a hosted championship race in the future because I think it's a fantastic racetrack and it's never had a dull moment in the next-gen era. It's been one of the race, best racetracks over the course of the last 10 years especially. So that means in the number one position, we have the Straight Talk Wireless 400 from Homestead Miami Speedway. This is one of not only the best races, I think, so far of the next-gen era. I would argue this is definitely the best race we have seen in the next-gen era. But this is one of the greatest NASCAR races of all time. This is an instant classic. From start to finish, you had amazing racing. Every driver in the NASCAR playoffs, except Joey Logano at the time, were up front competing for the lead and the win. And you had guys that were making very ballsy moves. You had underdogs like Carson Hosovar showing up. But you had drivers like Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin and Tyler Reddick and Ryan Blaney. All the guys who were below the cutoff line, by the way, that were all going for the win and were the main threats throughout the day. But then guys like Kyle Larson really started emerging. And he made a very ballsy move to try to get past Ryan Blaney and spun out. And that would unfortunately cost him a shot at the championship four. And we all thought we were going to get a lot of wrecks. No, we had seven, eight laps of just straight up badass racing from the restarts to the great racing throughout the field to the end battle between three drivers of Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, and Tyler Reddick. We saw two last lap passes in the final laps of this race. Ryan Blaney down the back straightaway with two laps to go, passing Denny Hamlin. And then Kyle Larson, not Kyle Larson, Tyler Reddick will go from third to first on the last lap with a very impressive hell yeah move up to the outside, past Ryan Blaney fair and square, and ended up going by him and picking up his third win and advancing his way to the championship four. You cannot write a script like that. This race was so good from start to finish, and I hope that Holmesay can get the season finale going forward, because for me, this was definitely the best race of 2024, because the racing was absolutely excellent, ex absolutely amazing this year at Homestead Miami Speedway. So, that is going to be it for ranking every single NASCAR Cup Series race for 2024. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, notifications on, so if I win a video, that's go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on Patreon as well. Let's we'll description below that, and comment your thoughts below on today's episode. What are your rankings for every single NASCAR Cup race? Let me know it in the comments below. If there's any major news that breaks later today, we'll discuss here live on the channel. If stuff breaks about people like Haley Deegan or Carl Irvis, Kurt Busch, you name it, or even if Ryan Priest gets announced RFK, we'll discuss that here live. Tomorrow, we're probably going to have like a small silly season update, perhaps, and we also might be doing the ranking on, on who the drivers you should watch out for. Along with the course, we will be doing a little some other content, including update video on what content should be releasing, probably coming out this weekend as well. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.